Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. It's um, nearly 8.30 in the morning, and today I'm going to start a uh, troubleshooting lab. Um, I've been um, not uh, labbing every day, but rather um, uh, labbing on the weekends. This is the holiday season. It's really hard to stay on track with studies, especially dedicating um, so much time. It's really hard. But um, but we got to keep up with it and got to stay sharp, right? Because if you um, you know if you don't stay sharp, you're going to get dull. So today I'm going to do a uh, troubleshooting lab from the Cisco 360 materials. And um, hey, good morning, good morning. Um, so this is part of the CCIE um, Route Switch One package from uh, Cisco as part of their Cisco 360. I think it's called Cisco Expert Level Training. Um, I have the lab hosted here, and uh, I printed my materials, which are the troubleshooting tickets, the requirements, I guess, uh, and the topologies, which I have here on the desk. So, um, also, this lab is a, as far as difficulty level, is basic to intermediate, and so it shouldn't be too difficult, but... Um, you know, if you're not labbing every day and if you're not solving these problems every day and they become unfamiliar to you, they will be difficult. So I'm hoping I don't get stuck on many things, but I'm expecting that I will. Um, this lab is supposed to be completed in two hours, which is the amount of time I think they give you for the actual CCIE lab, for the troubleshooting portion of the CCIE lab anyhow. So um, I'm going to, I have a two hour timer here on my phone. I'm going to start it as soon as I start the lab and then see how far I get because there are 10 troubleshooting tickets. The tickets cover a lot of technologies. Um, it covers DMVPN, it covers uh, switching, it covers IPv4 OSPF, it covers IPv4 EIGRP, IPv4 RIP, redistribution, security, IPv6 troubleshooting, I'm just kind of getting the main sections here. Quality of service, QoS, and then IP service troubleshooting. So 10 tickets to do in two hours. So basically, if you get stuck at any one point, it's a good chance you will not be able to complete uh, within the two hours allotted. Now, do you in the CCIE actual lab exam, do you need to solve all 10 tickets? I don't think so, right? I think there's a, a number of tickets you need to solve. There's a point value you need to achieve, and each trouble ticket is worth a different point value. For example, ticket number one is worth two points, ticket number two is worth three points, so they, I bet they'll range between one and three or maybe four points, and there's probably a minimum score you have to hit, so it might be you need 10 points to pass that section. So out of 10 tickets, you might have to solve five at, at two at uh, five tickets at two points apiece that would give you 10 points so uh, whatever the actual score is a uh, passing score I don't know um, but I do know there is a minimum passing score uh, and I think that varies per exam right um, per the tickets you're given so I have uh, I have my lab booted up here I'm gonna change the cameras around um, and then start my timer and get started and um, I've already read through the requirements and the restrictions uh, for this lab. And uh, it basically, some, some important things to point out in case anyone's not familiar with this style of test is some of the restrictions are uh, you cannot use any static routes. You have to advertise loopback interfaces with their original masks. The network 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 should not appear in any routing table using show IP route. Do not use the IP default gateway or IP default network commands. Do not introduce any new IP addresses. Uh, you cannot change IP addresses. Um, everything needs to be reachable from everywhere. Um, so if you're doing these kind of labs often, these aren't new requirements they aren't um, unusual but if you're not familiar with this style of testing um, then it certainly can be um, uh, challenging uh, a lot of times they put some pretty stiff restrictions on like you know having to you know uh, 
establish an adjacency without using multicast or or you know use no static routes i mean just like this said um, often there are some pretty heavy restrictions um, but because this is a basic level it's a little bit wide open so without further ado let's get everything set up and uh, we'll dive right in here i have my lab i'll circle through the routers so this lab uses 10 routers and four switches so i got r1 r2 r3 r4 r5 you see here at the bottom left i'm changing uh, router 6 router 7 router 8 router 9 uh, router 10 is the backbone router switch 1 switch 2 switch 3 switch 4 and back around okay so uh let's dive uh, right in I'm going to start a little bit of music, so it'll drown myself out a little bit. And uh, I'll read the tickets as we go, and we'll see what we can solve. Uh, troubleshooting ticket number one. Users reported that the connectivity within the DMVPN is broken. R2 can ping R1, but R2 cannot ping R4 across the DMVPN subnet. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of topology and expected behavior and special goals and restrictions. All right, so if I look at, I don't see on the topology drawing where is the DMVPN network. So let's use the R1, R2, and R4. Use the DMVPN subnet 172.10.124.0 to exchange the IPv4 traffic as shown in the IPv4 diagram. Okay. Ethernet 01 interface on the subnet are used for DMVPN multi-point GRE tunnel source. R1 is the DMVPN hub. R2 and 4 are the DMVPN spokes. All right, here's what we, here's what the objective that they want. All IPv4 same subnet tr addresses that are configured on the DMVPN must be reachable without requiring routing protocol support. Only IPv4 unicast traffic is forwarding between the DMVPN devices. R1 is the next hop server for routers 2 and 4. Okay. So this should be pretty easy. Let's dive right in. I'm going to... Oh, I should have started my timer. I forgot. Starting the timer. All right. Counting down. All right. So let's do um, a show IP interface brief. I want to see what our tunnel is. Tunnel 124, show run interface, tunnel 124. All right, tunnel source, uh, GRE multipoint, that's fine, key 10, network ID 10. Uh, this is for OSPF. All right, uh, show IP interface brief. I'm trying to attack this the same way that I would in the exam. After all, I am preparing for the exam. All right. Uh, I did not check what is uh, 101011. All right, 101011. All right, this is wrong here. Key 10 network ID. All right, so what I need to do is say no to that. And put in the correct, oh, wait a second. Am I, am I confused? Oh my gosh, I think I am confused. I do want to keep that. Uh, 172.10.124.1. 172.10.124.1, 24-bit mask. It said router 2 can ping router 1, but router 2 cannot ping router 4 across the DMVPN. Let's take a look at router 4. Also, here on router 1, I want to do show 
DMVPN. Okay, so. Let's take a look. Alright, it is mapped wrong here. Network ID. Jerry Multi. Now I'm broadcast. Should be 10 1 1. And then if I do. Um, shut shut the tunnel down and bring it back up it should send that uh, that registration message as soon as it comes back up let me also make sure do show IP interface brief 10 10 1 4 bring the tunnel back up oh uh, show DM VPN Looks like both are registered now. Okay, so from router one, let's see if we can ping both. Successful. Let's do the same thing from router two. And from router four. Okay, so everybody can reach everybody. I think that one is solved. So if I check the time, it uh, looks like it took about five minutes. Um, this one wasn't wasn't very difficult. So um, I'm just going to put a check mark next to that one on my sheet just to indicate that um, I've completed it and that I think I got it right. So the next one is switched network troubleshooting. So this one is going to involve the switches, I'm sure. Users reported that the switched network does not operate according to the requirements provided in the switched network troubleshooting section. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of the topology, the expected behavior of network policies, and the special goals and restrictions subsections to determine if your solution is appropriate. Next page. Uh, the switched Ethernet topology for this lab consists of four VLANs as shown on the IPv4 IGP and IPv4 uh, excuse me, IPv6 IGP diagrams. No additional VLANs may be configured or used. All trunk links are encapsulated with 802.1Q. The Ethernet links that are shown on the IPv4 diagram and IPv6 IGP di diagram must support same subnet reachability and the routing protocol shown. All switches should be in the VTP domain Cisco 360. Only one VLAN is allowed on the trunk link between switch one and switch two. All right, that's our expected behavior. So I guess the first thing we can do is show BTP status. All right, it's running version one. Cisco 360 is transparent. Let's just put it on all of them. I'm really trying to race a little bit because I don't want to run out of time. I want to see if I can be successful with time still left. Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm checking the operational mode, I'm checking the domain, and I'm checking the version. And as I click through the four switches, switch one, switch two, switch three, and switch four, they are all in transparent mode. They're all in version one. They all have the domain name uh, Cisco 360. Uh, only one VLAN is allowed on the trunk between switch one and switch two. Let's get on switch one and switch two. Show um, show interface trunking. I guess let's do show CDP neighbors and show CDP neighbors. All right here's switch one. This is switch one. Two and three. Ethernet two and three. Here's switch two, Ethernet two, and three. Okay, show run interface ETH two two. 
two, three. Okay, that's trunking everything. And show run interface, Ethernet, two, 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 three. And that's trunking everything. It says only one VLAN is allowed on the trunk link between switch one and switch two. Okay. No additional ethernet interfaces should be created in your solution. All links that are administratively down must remain so. Ensure that only two spanning trees span over VLANs 10, 20, and 30. First spanning tree should span over VLANs 10 and 20. Second spanning tree should span over VLAN 30. Switch one should be the root switch for 10. Switch two should be the root switch for 30. <sighs> Spanning tree should operate according to the following requirements. The preferred path between switch one and switch three for VLAN 10 should be through port uh, Ethernet 1.3. The preferred path. Do not use the same method to implement these requirements. No configuration is allowed on switch one to implement these requirements. Jeez, that's tough. That is a lot to that is a lot to digest. Um, especially on an unfamiliar topology, you know, having never seen this. So show spanning tree. What are we doing here? Multiple spanning tree. Okay. MST01. MST1, MST2. Uh... MST Alright, this is MST0 VLANs that are mapped are 10 uh, Or is it rather is not 10 not 20 not 30 but everything else. Okay, so let's check multiple spanning tree 1 That's 10 and 20 multiple spanning tree 2 that's 30. Check it here. Show spanning spanning tree, multiple spanning tree uh, 1 and 30. Okay, I'm just checking for the proper VLAN mapping. Uh, the root is this switch for multiple spanning tree 2. Switch 2 should be the root switch for VLAN 30. It is. And for switch 1 should be the root for VLAN 10. Multiple spanning tree 1. This switch is. Okay, perfect. So let me make some check marks. All right, both of those. Um, ensure that only two spanning trees span over VLANs. 10, 20, and 30. The first spanning tree should span over both. Okay. That I have ensured. All links that are administratively done must remain so. I won't change that. No additional Ethernet interfaces can be used in your solution. Okay. Next is this block, which is about five bullet points. Spanning tree should operate according to the following requirements. The preferred path between switch one and switch three, which I guess I have to look at the Ethernet switching diagram. Guys, if anyone wants to take a peek or, or follow along with, with this lab and, and some of the labs that I do as part of the Cisco 360, um, as part of the Cisco 360 stuff, let me see if I can do. Uh, this here is um, uh, where you get into that. So this is the Cisco expert level training. And you can buy a block of hours um, on their gear. And you get the workbooks. And you get labs to do. And they even have some graded labs, which are really cool. Um, I have a couple of graded labs as part of my package. But I'm going to save those for the very end. Because once you do a graded lab, you can only do it once. And then you have to buy it again. 
So I've already bought it and I'm saving it because I make sure that I kind of want to use that as, as the, the real barometer of am I ready for the lab exam or not. And even though it's not the same exact exam and it's, you know, relative and difficulty level, um, it, it will at least give me, um, you know, a better understanding of whether or not I'm ready. So, so that's where I'm at. Uh, but if anyone wants to follow along, uh, I'm doing the uh, Troubleshooting Lab TA01 here. All right, hang on a second. And I'll get these uh, last bullet points on spanning tree. I know I still have the timer going, so I need to get back in it. All right. Um, the preferred path between switch 1 and switch 3 for VLAN 10 should be through port uh, Ethernet 1.3. All right, let's take a look. All right, switch 1 and switch 3. Let's take a look at what switch 1 for VLAN 10. Uh, which is here. Okay, so let me see switch three. Show spanning tree. Multiple spanning tree. Show spanning tree, multiple spanning tree one. It's 10 and 20. So it wants us to use um, this interface for VLAN 10. But it sees this as the root port. All right, I think there's a way to do this. I can't remember what it is. Show spanning tree interface, uh, maybe multiple spanning tree one uh, interface. Which one is it using? It's using one two. One two is the root. So here's one two. Uh, it has a priority of one twenty eight. And one two. Same priority, same cost. Uh, lower port ID. How do I reset that? Uh, not reset, but how do I configure? Ethernet uh, one three. So I'm on switch one. I'm going to configure it on the switch one side. I'm going to try to lower the priority number. Um, spanning tree, multiple spanning tree one. 
port priority in increments of 64. All right, hang on. So switch three. So show uh, spanning tree, uh, multiple spanning tree one. Uh, enter multiple spanning tree one. And now this switched, right? So now we have the root port on Ethernet one three. But I still can't figure out how to get that that view I'm looking for. So, so that worked by chain, by lowering the priority on the upstream switch. Uh, but how do I see that? Uh, show spanning tree interface on three. Ah, uh, this is what I wanted to see. Yeah, this is what I wanted to see. Okay. Uh, Ethernet 1.3 of multiple spanning tree 1 is root forwarding. Uh, uh, designated port ID. Uh, designated port priority. Where is that? Designated bridge priority. Here's our... Path cost, port priority, port identifier, uh, designated root bridge address, designated bridge. That should be um, us. Is that the same MAC address? 0B00. Okay, show spanning. Uh, I guess I'm seeing something in the output that is inconsistent of what I thought it should be. Uh, show spanning tree, multiple spanning tree. Uh, show spanning tree, multiple spanning tree, instance one. Okay. Our bridge is D and the root is B. I'm looking at this uh, value right here. Okay, all right, so I think that one is done, but there's still another task here. Uh, do not use the same method to implement these requirements. No configuration is allowed on switch one to implement these requirements. Well, damn, I've already made a mistake. I have already made a mistake. <sighs> Okay, I made the change on switch one. No configuration configuration is allowed on switch one to implement these requirements. Man, this is uh, tough. Okay, which means if I up arrow this, we should see Ethernet one, two, and one, three switch from um, root forward to alternate block and root forward. And we do. Okay, which means I can't use priority there. Maybe I can use cost. Show spanning tree, multiple spanning tree one um, interface, ETH one two. 
and one three. Uh, interface ETH13. Change the interface spanning tree cost for an instance. Okay. Hey, trust the process. Good morning. Good morning, Tiffany. Everybody, good morning. Shout out to everybody out there. Thanks for joining me this morning. I'm working on a Cisco 360 lab, the TA01, it's a CCIE route switch one uh, lab. This is um, one of the first labs in the package. And I'm doing it just as a sort of refresher because I haven't been labbing a lot lately. Holidays really throws me off. So um, I'm just trying to stay sharp a little bit. It's tough though, it really is tough. All right, so this did flip, right, for uh, multiple spanning tree one, which is VLAN 10, configuration only on switch three. I didn't touch switch one. And here's Ethernet one, two, uh, Ethernet one, two, and one, three. And now we see we have root forwarding on one, three. So the preferred path between switch one and switch three for VLAN 10 should be port one, three. I'll give myself a check mark for that. That's because I'm marking it as complete and I believe I got it correct. Trust the process. Let's see, I'm starting my first job as a network lab engineer at Cisco. What's your advice to be successful on my position? Wow. Um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations, um, engineer at Cisco. So very, very, very cool job. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of great people in the industry in this field and and that myself and a lot of us follow on uh, social media um, uh, work at Cisco so you're gonna be around uh, really good people um, gonna have a really good environment and a, and a true environment to consume as much uh, information as you want so my advice my honest to God advice for any job, you know, and I'm glad you added that or in any field in general. Um, you have to be open to trying new things. You have to always be learning. You have to show your passion. So whatever you're passionate about, share that with the people you work with. Um, and if you're passionate about routing and switching and you show that you're passionate about routing and switching, then they will give you jobs and tasks and things that you're passionate about. Um, if you're passionate about security, you know, and you want to get into security, um, then share your passion with people and people will say, oh, you know, let's give uh, that security um, lab or, or that security problem or, or, or whatever the task may be. Let's give it to so and so um, because they're into that. So don't be afraid to open up, you know, a lot of the people, um, you know, that I admire and I follow, um, I enjoy, uh, you know, their presence on social media and in real life because they open up, because they share part of their lives with me, you know, and that's what I try to do here with my streams is share my journey and sort of open up and expose myself a little bit, you know, to, to help others. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a long journey here. <laughs> Uh, and I don't want to have to do it alone. But definitely share your passion with whatever you're passionate with, with your new teammates, um, with, your, with your personal relationships, with your business relationships. I mean, if you're passionate about playing guitar or piano or something, you know, let them know. Uh, and uh, the next time someone needs a guitar player for someone, they're going to ask you because they know that you're passionate about it. So um, seeing someone's passion is, is very cool at work. Um, I am very fortunate to work for a, a small business that uh, recognizes the passion in, in each of us as individuals and, um, and really accelerates that. And, uh, and I have a great team of people who I work with, uh, and it's because of that. You know, I know 
Um, a lot of my coworkers, if I have specific questions about something that I know they're passionate about, I go straight to them. And it makes a really great working environment. And, um, you know, it means we can all learn from each other. Um, so a lot of people come to me uh, because uh, I'm, you know, been doing this routing and switching journey for such a long time. Um, I'm a little bit passionate about it. Uh, I guess I'm probably a lot passionate about it. And so they come to me with uh, networking questions or networking problems. And, uh, and I enjoy being able to help. So, um, you know, whatever you do in life, make sure you share your passion with other people and, um, and, and the relationships will follow. Um, and through that, you'll be able to grow. You really, really, really will be able to grow um, professionally and personally. Uh, and that's, that's my honest to God, um, honest to God truth uh, about that. Uh, let's see, I was using school gear to lab, but now I'm done with college. What should I use to lab, physical gear or virtual? Um, I would go virtual. You can do almost everything you could ever want to do um, in a virtual lab. That's what I use. I use all virtual. I don't have any physical gear. When I started my CCNA journey five years ago, I bought some routers and switches and stuff, and I quickly got rid of them and went virtual, all virtual. Um, now I use EVNG regularly uh, for almost all of my labs. And um, GNS3 is a good product too. Uh, and if you're using like the Cisco Academy or Cisco Learning Network, they give you Packet Tracer. You can use Packet Tracer too if you want. Um, Packet Tracer is a bit limited uh, when you get to the higher level certifications, but uh, it'll do just fine for CCNA and most of CCMP. But definitely go virtual. Therefore, you know, you can be on the move. But if you're working at Cisco, um, there are lots and lots and lots of uh, opportunities. Um, there's lots and lots of opportunities for you to lab on real gear or virtual gear or Cisco Viral. You know, let's not forget there's a product called Cisco Viral, um, which I'm not a fan of. Um, I have used it previously, but I'm just not a fan of anymore. Um, but, uh, but Cisco does own that product, and it does well um, if you have, you know, big servers to put it on. No packet tracer, please. Yeah, I know, I know. It it's uh, it's not perfect, but I mean, during the course of my CCNA studies, I almost exclusively used packet tracer, and I got through it just fine. And I know lots of other people who use packet tracer for CCNA or they're starting their CCNP. Once you get to the CCNP and security level or data center or stuff like that, you need to move beyond packet tracer, and I definitely recommend. Uh, getting familiar with uh, GNS3 and, uh, and EVNG. So uh, that's, that's my advice uh, for now. I need to get back into this lab. So, uh, but thanks for the questions. If you've got any more questions, post them in the chat, and, uh, and I'll get to them when I can. All right, I think that task um, for Switch 3 uh, is solved here. The next one is the preferred path between switch one and two for VLAN 30 should be through ports two, three. So let's get on uh, switch one, show CDP neighbors. Let's figure out switch two is connected to two, two and two, three. Here's switch two, show CDP neighbors. Switch one is connected to two, two and two, three. And so they want traffic for VLAN 30 to go over two, three. So let's show a uh, spanning tree, multiple spanning tree instance to enter. From switch two's perspective, it's the root. It's the root um, bridge for this uh, multiple spanning tree instance. So let's go over to switch one, show spanning tree, multiple spanning tree instance to and we can see we're using Ethernet 2.2 to get to the root bridge. Uh, and this is an alternate link. And the task wants us to make this the uh, root port and, uh, and this the alternate link. Uh, do you mind a connection on LinkedIn? Yeah, go ahead. You can get me on there. table the counter I 
Okay, guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your honesty. Now show me some responsibility and go clean it up. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Is this gonna be the time for the cleaning? Or are you just gonna do it later? Yeah, you can do it later. Alright, go ahead, honey. You, um, no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're studying for CCIE or anything, you're always, uh, if you're a parent, you're always a parent. Doesn't matter when you're studying, when you're streaming, when you're anything, you're always a parent and you have to answer these tough questions, you know, like what to do when you get marker on the table. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and connect on, uh, on LinkedIn if you choose. Uh, you can um, you can d DM me on Twitter or something if you want to uh, send a link, or uh, you can try and find me on there. All right, so for this one, I think we're going to change the priority value on uh, switch two because one of the requirements here is no configurations should be made on switch one. So let's influence switch one by making a change on switch two. So let's do interface. Um, ETH 2.3 and do spanning tree MST uh, MST 2 um, port priority let's call it 64 enter alright that should not affect switch 2 switch 2 is the root bridge so that should remain the root bridge. Uh, spanning tree two. So yeah, so all of its ports are forwarding. They're all designated ports and they're all in the forwarding state. Let's go to switch one. And what we want to see is we want to see these two interfaces flip. We want to see two three become root and two two become um, alternate and blocking. So let's up arrow. And boom, I think we got it. So again, this lab is rated at a, as a basic lab, uh, which means uh, it's basic to intermediate, actually, uh, which means um, this is basic connectivity, so nothing too complicated. Um, all right, so I think that's two tickets, two tickets that I've solved that gives me two points plus three points is five points. So let's, you know, let's try and get all the tickets. I have an hour and 24 minutes left. So this was a two hour lab. So I've already used up over 30 minutes and I've just solved two tickets just to kind of give everyone an idea of, you know, this can be very, very stressful. Uh, stressful because you run out of time, you know, and you get stuck on a problem. So let's go to the next one. Um, IPv4 OSPF troubleshooting section. Users report that the OSPF uh, routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the IPv4 OSPF troubleshooting section. OSPF is not stable on the DMVPN. Also, also routers 7, 8, and 5 do not see the DMVPN subnet in their respective routing tables. I got to look at a topology. 7, 8, and what? 7, 8, and 5. While resolving this ticket, see the restrictions, expected behavior. Okay. Users reported that the OSPF routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the troubleshooting section. OSPF is not stable on the DMVPN. Also, okay, so two part. OSPF or IPv4 is divided into three areas. Area 124, area zero, Area 23. Only these listed subnets should be internal to OSPF. Should be internal to OSPF. Area 0 includes 172, 10, 35, 0, and 172, 10, 105, 24. Area 124 
includes this one and where's 101 okay loop back area 23 172 10 23 expected behavior OSPF should elect a DR and must use IPv4 unicast communications for the control packets on the DMVPN subnet. Okay, this is one task. OSPF must provide stable reachability between all internal subnets. Okay, that's all that were just listed above. All internal OSPF routes should get an administrative distance of 121. All external OSPF routes should get an administrative distance of 171. The following subnet should be advertised across OSPF, but they should not belong to any OSPF area. Okay, so those are going to be externals. All right, special restrictions. OSPF area 23 should be authenticated with the password Cisco. The password should not be sent in clear text. All right, so this is a task. Router 3 should be system router three should systematically become the dr the subnet 23 should not be advertised into area 124 by any ospf process huh? loopback networks must be advertised with their original masks all right, this um, has a lot of information in it. So let's kind of start at the top and break this down a little bit. All right, let's start with um, area zero, which is router five. So show IP interface brief. We should have a loopback 105. Oops, I want to do um, show IP OSPF interface uh, point to point. Point to point is good. And I want to see on router one. I'm just checking the loopbacks. Show IP interface brief. Show IP OSPF interface. It's loopback. CompT interface, IP OSPF, network type, point to point. And then um, show IP interface, it's a slash 24. Do show IP interface, loopback 105. And I'm just verifying that uh, it is indeed a slash 24 and that I don't need to change the mask for anything. All right. Um, all right, so on router five, let's do um, show IP OSPF interface brief. All right, area zero process ID for our loopback and uh, our physical interface. Okay, looks good. Uh, router three, show IP OSPF interface brief. Uh, looks like we got a virtual link here. Uh, Ethernet zero. Uh, Ethernet zero one in area zero. Ethernet zero zero in 23. All right, seven, eight, and two. Show IP OSPF interface brief. 23, seven, show IP OSPF, show IP OSPF interface brief. It's 23, uh, router two. Show IP OSPF interface brief. All right, 23. Uh, virtual link which is down, okay. And for the life of me, I cannot figure, I cannot remember what NV is. NV zero, don't remember what it is. 
and then our tunnel interface is area 124. So really, I'm just right now, I'm just checking the um, area boundaries. Show IP OSPF interface brief 124 and then router one. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Just want to make sure that the OSPF boundaries are, uh, they match the topology drawing. Okay. <sighs> OSPF should elect a designated router and must use the IP before unicast communications for the control packets on the DMBPN subnet. All right, so let's do router one, two, and four. Show run, interface, tunnel one, two, four. Show run, interface. All right, one, two, and four. Show run, interface, tunnel one, two, four. All right, OSPF network non-broadcast, which means it will elect a DR and a BDR. Uh, all right, non-broadcast. I see we have a priority zero here. I think what we're going to do is change that. Is OSPF should elect a designated router and must use the IP before unicast for the control packets on the DMVPN. So on router one, let's take out the priority zero because priority zero means you're ineligible to become a DR. So instead, let's do let's do 10 and then let's change here interface tunnel 124 and let's make it so the two spokes can never be the um, DR or BDR. Okay, all internal um, OSPF routes should get administrative distance. Uh, show run section router OSPF. Intra, inter, external. Not what I wanted to see. Show run section. Uh, let's see if there's a different way to do this. Show IP OSPF. Show IP protocols. I'm just sort of exploring around. Here we go, distance. Why does that say 171? It's weird, I don't see... I don't see any multicast mapped, but... 
I don't see any multicast map, but we do have an adjacency. Show IP, OSPF, neighbor. All right, this is uh, uh, router one. It says non-broadcast, which means I should need a um, a neighbor statement, but I don't see one. I also don't see a multicast mapping. So uh, show run, uh, show run um, section router OSPF. How is this happening though? This is so strange. Dead timers, what, uh, going to non broadcast, what, 30 and, and 130? Cannot figure out how that's happening. Oh, wait, I see neighbors here. Wait a second. This is router one. Okay, maybe I'm just confusing myself. Show run interface, uh, tunnel 124. Uh, show run section router OSPF. I see network network. Show run section router OSPF. I see network. All right, I think I'm just gonna leave that alone and then and then check, uh, check my uh, scores later. Um, I would assume we need like symmetric neighbor statements. Uh, it's how I've done it in the past, but I, I don't I don't know what's going on. Why it's I don't know why it's working without symmetric neighbor statements, but it is working. Okay, um, this is taking way too long. Um, OSPF should elect the designated router on the DMVPN subnet. OSPF must provide stable reachability. All internal OSPF routes should get administrative distance of 121. All external should get administrative distance of uh, 171. The following subnet should be advertised across OSPF, but they should not belong to any OSPF area. All right, so we just did one, two, and four uh, as far as checking those. So let's do seven and eight. Um, show IP protocols. Seven, eight, I'm gonna go in three and five. This is our whole OSPF domain here. That's rip. Here is that's rip. Where's OSPF? OSPF. Uh, 121, 121, 171. That's three. Here's five. Uh, 
Okay. So that one is done. All internal. Nothing to do there, just verifying. R3 should systematically become the DR. All right, show IP, OSPF, interface brief. Show IP, OSPF, interface brief. It is the DR. Show run section router OSPF. Show um, IP OSPF interface. That's a network type broadcast. Um, So I am the DR, oh, excuse me. I am the DR router three. Okay, so this will not participate in DR. In a DR election. their original mass. It's taking a long time. All right, I think I checked this already and there were no additional loopbacks. Um, there were no additional loopbacks. Uh, with OSPF turned off. All right, what do I have left? Uh, I need to make sure area 23 is authenticated. So that's router three. Uh, it should be authenticated with the password Cisco. The password should not be sent in clear text. Message digest authentication enabled. IP OSPF interface. All right, Mrs. Digest seven eight show um, IP OSPF interface. Message Digest authentication enabled. Router two show IP OSPF interface. Message Digest authentication, and then show run section. Router OSPF. I know we got a virtual link in here somewhere. Authentication message digest. Area 23 virtual link. Message digest. Key one is the MD5 Cisco. So I guess we can check by doing show IP OSPF. 
Neighbors. Twenty-three, ten, twenty-three, thirty. All right, that's seven and eight. Um, okay, this is a zero. Uh, show where's my interface? Paste that in. So it looks like the O in Cisco um, was a zero instead of a capital O. section let me just do virtual and see what happens virtual link authentication message digest message digest key okay show IP OSPF virtual links just scanning here show IP OS OSPF neighbors. Here we go. We have router five, uh, router two, seven, eight, and then the. Uh, oh, this is router two. This is the virtual link. Okay. Uh, uh. So much stuff swirling around in my head. I don't even know where I am. I have one hour left. Well, let's double check and make sure we got this ticket all solved up. Uh, still some more tasks to execute. Repack now because we to advertise the original mask. The subnet should not be advertised. Okay, we still need to do this one. And those should be external. So let's do, from router one's perspective, show IP route. We want to see 100 and 102. Okay. 100 and 102 is seen as OSPF external. All right, so let's try. All right, external, external. Just hop around, show IP route. All right, it's connected here. And 102 is connected also. That's on router two. All right, next one is seven and eight. Show IP route. External, external, show IP route. All 
I was thinking I could just see externals only. Uh, external, external. It's eight. Let's go to three. Show IP route. This is rip and rip because of a lower administrative distance. Remember, we changed it to 121. Show IP route. Looks like there's rip between three and four, probably. Okay. All right, so this one yeah, it should be good. All right, the subnet 172.10.23 should not be advertised into area 124. Uh, oh, boy. All right, let's see. Uh, 172.10.23. It's here. We're learning it from router two as an in inter area route. So we want to prevent this from entering area 124. And I'm not even sure like off the top of my head I don't know how to do that let's see redistribute connected subnets route map area 24 filter prefix filter list prefix num no 23 out let's see uh, show run uh, how about show IP prefix lists I don't see the problem. I'm I don't recall All right, so let me just try these suckers Filter networks between areas. to show
172.16. I think it should be 172.10. I think that's the problem here. Yeah. Okay. Do show. I think that's the problem. It's an incorrect prefix list. Right implementation, but uh, wrong subnet. I was going to say, off the top of my head, it looked like it was going to work, but I was expecting something else. Do show run. Prefix. So we're going to change this to 10. And let's change this to 4. Show IP prefix. All right, so now we're denying this. We're going to leave this entry in there because um, in previous labs that I've done, it'll say things like, you know, all existing entries in a prefix list or an access list must remain. And so you just have to sort of work around them. All right, so now that prefix should disappear from this entry here from router one. Hang on, it's here. 172.10.23. Do I need to like, I don't know. All right, it's gone now. Let's see if it comes back. Oh, okay, buddy. Come on.
All right. All right, everybody's full, full, full. That damn subnet is still there. How do I filter it out? How do I filter it out? Hmm. Anybody have any ideas? I'm trying to think if it was like a like an inverse operation then everything would be denied. Right? doesn't make sense because this slash 24 what the heck I, I don't think that's right I don't think that's right I'm doing some reading here on a filter list. Why is this not working as expected? All right, prefix list is the only option here. Um, uh, 
filter list for all interfaces not set. kind of just want to see like let me see tunnel let's see let's see if it has anything about the filter list what the hell uh should I be route it's still inter area. So that's a type three LSA. It's learning from router two. Router two. Should be filtering that. And this should be denying everything. So I tell you what, let me just, uh, let's just, let's give it a prefix list that doesn't exist. Which means it should filter everything I do believe. So clear IP OSPF process, yes. So which means router one, show IP route, has that withdrawn. getting stuck on this ticket. I got about 30 minutes left. <sighs> I feel like this was sort of like a lot of bogus crap. There it is again. Shouldn't this be filtered completely? Show IP OSPF database um, summary let me see where's my summary Shouldn't it be filtered? All right, let's see. Deny this one, permit everything else. 
Okay. Router OSPF1. Area 124. Uh, filter list. Prefix. The name of the prefix list is this one. And we want it in the outbound direction. Enter. Now, clear IP OSPF1 process. Yes. Oh boy. Uh, why is it still there? I don't know. Um, I need to make a note about this. Um, filter OSPF prefixes between areas. Wait a second. Wait a second. Oh crap, am I doing it the wrong way? We wanna filter it from coming into area 20, 124. Fuck. All right, I'm gonna leave that note because that's something I need to work on. Let's change, let's flip that around, right? Let's flip that, that filter around. Uh, do show run section router OSPF. Uh, Let's change it to the in direction. I think that might fix my problem. Clear IP OSPF one process. All right, let's let that cook for a minute. Let's go over to router one. Okay. that. Prefix has been withdrawn. Let's see what happens. I hope I have enough time to finish this and get on to the next one. This is only the third ticket. It has taken a long time. <laughs> only two hours allotted for 10 tickets. Unbelievable. I mean, I think it's just an obvious uh, representation that I'm not ready. You know, I should be, I, I would think in two hours, I should be far beyond halfway. Especially this lab is considered one of the, I don't know, I call it basic or easier labs. I think I should probably be, where I would like to be, I guess, is past halfway on an advanced lab. And here I am on a basic lab and I'm only on ticket number three. I am really feeling bad about that. Should I pee OSPF neighbor? All right, everybody's full, 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 full. And router three, not router three, excuse me, router one. Uh, should I pee route? Does not have the 23 in there, uh, but still does have the other ones and is learning other prefixes from our neighbor. And so from the database, it's not in the database, which means it is being filtered. So that was a, a, a problem in my, you know, my, my understanding of the, the implementation. 
so there were two things wrong with that original one. First of all, the permit any at the bottom, which is the permit quad zero slash zero, was wrong. So it would have filtered everything. And um, the direction was wrong. So show run section router OSPF. This is what we were looking at here. It used to say out, and it had a different prefix list here. I created a new prefix list. Um, it said out, which means you want to filter things go leaving area 124, going out of 124. Rather, the correct way to do it is we wanted to filter stuff from coming in to area 24, those, those um, type 3 LSAs. So I wonder here, show IP OSPF database, if I'm in area zero, let me look at area 124. 124 type ones, type twos, here's type threes. We don't even have the type threes in here, even though it's directly connected. So it's, it's filtering properly. That's pretty cool. Um, and that was my misunderstanding of that. So let me complete this this note, this thought here. And in fact, I might grab this as the example. Just a little note helps me sort of word it in my head so when I see it next time I could just you know recite it And obviously, it can only be applied uh, at an ABR, right? At an area border router is where you can stop that. Because all of the routers within an area must maintain the exact same database. So it wouldn't make sense to, to do that on a OSPF internal router. All right, so this filtering is finally done. That was a combination of my misunderstanding and, and the misconfiguration uh, in the lab had to correct. So I think that's all for this. So I'm going to go ahead and give this one, number three, a check mark, which means that I think I confidently solved all of the tasks within. Time check, 28 minutes to solve another ticket. This will be ticket number four. This is really tough stuff, guys. It's not just like leisurely solving tickets whenever you want. Um, you know, having going up against the timer as well, it just, just ups the level of stress. <laughs> um, know much higher than you would just do it if you just felt like labbing OSPF for the day. Users reported that EIGRP routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the IPv4 EIGRP troubleshooting section. Router 6 does not form any EIGRP neighbor relationships. Okay, here's router 6. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of the topology, expected behavior, and special goals and restrictions subsection to determine if your solution is appropriate. As shown on the IPv4 IGP diagram, uh, AS100 should operate on VLAN, VLAN 20. Only subnets 
Uh, 65. 120. Should be internal. One oh six. Uh, the following subnets should be redistributed into EIGRP one oh six and one oh five. Uh, the devices that are located in EIGRP should trust only authenticated EIGRP messages. The trusted password should be Cisco one. Set from and it gives us a date and should never expire. The password should not be sent in clear text. Special, special goals and restrictions. Ensure that router six adds a value 1000 to the EIGRP metric received for the subnet 120. All internal EIGRP routes should get an administrative distance of 123. All external EIGRP routes should get an administrative distance of 169. Okay. Um, All right, that's going to be six, nine, show run section. And then router six. All right, let's see. Um, we got a network statement here, router five. Uh, let's see, router six. We got a network statement here for six, for five, and for nine. Okay, uh, distance EIGRP. Distance, distance. Okay, so what we can do is we can check off couple of these things should get should get ensure that router six adds the value 1000 all right we'll need to do that okay so router five uh, that's internal router six that's internal and then router nine should have two statements okay looks good <coughs> all right let's take a look at this route map show um, Okay, that looks good. Uh, I don't see any authentication yet. Uh, show IP protocols, EIGRP. Okay, probably on the interface. Take a look here. And the specifications on that. 
Nine and five, same thing. Five, six, nine. It's EIGRP one hundred. How about show IP EIGRP neighbors? Show IP EI GRP neighbors. All right, we just need to change this AS number here. Five, six, nine. Show keychain. All right. Um, send lifetime one uh, valid now. Valid now. Accept lifetime. Okay. Send and receive Cisco one. Cisco one. Looks like it's good. Looks like it's good. Cisco one is good. Okay, so now let's check. Show IP EIGRP neighbors. Two neighbors there. Okay, that looks good. Show um, IP EIGRP uh, neighbors. EIGRP. Let's take a look at router six. Show IP route. Just uh, working my way through this. Wanting to see if we can see if a offset list has been applied. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to tell if an office offset list has been has been um, So, um, show access lists, maybe? Okay, one match. I guess so, right? So it's probably received an update that contains that prefix one time. Uh, 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 uh. 
Okay. I think that's fine. Uh, only subnet 65 and 120 should be internal to EIGRP. So, show IP route EIGRP. All right, 120 and 165, okay. Okay. So I'm gonna give myself a check mark for that. Time check, 15 minutes. Okay, next section is rip. Uh, next section is RIP. Users reported that the RIP routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description. Okay, RIP operates between routers 3 and 4, as shown on the IPv4 diagram. Router 3 should send only RIP 1 updates and listen to only RIP 2 updates. Router 4 should send only RIP 2 updates and listen to only, <laughs> excuse me, RIP 1s. All right, let's check that. Show IP proto rip uh, interface routing for networks uh, send and receive triggers okay no interfaces uh, all right router three I'm on router three should send one and receive two. Router four. Send to receive one. Okay. Rip updates should be sent on only the ten forty three subnet. Okay. All RIP updates should be sent to only the destination. So let's take a look. Show run interface. All right, I think we can do this. Uh, v Let's see what's happening here. Can we get this in before the timer? IP RIP B2 broadcast. Yeah, I don't think it gives me the information of whether it's sent on a broadcast or not. Uh, that would be a debug command. All RIP routes should get an administrative distance of 119. All right, uh, distance 119. One nineteen. RIP version two should be configured on router four. Okay, I think it is. Uh, show run section router rip. Show run section router rip.
Okay. Alright, I think that's good. I think that's good. Only had to do one small thing. You know, when I go back to grade this, it's hard to remember what you did to solve these tickets, but... You know. Uh, time check. 11 minutes, ticket number 6. So I've made it to the halfway point. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if I got everything right. Let's see. Redistribution. This will likely be a pain in the ass. It's a three-pointer. Um... I mean, maybe the security prevent IP address spoofing on both Ethernet interfaces of router 3. Any denied packet should trigger a log on router 3. Let's see if I can just skip ahead and do this one. I almost never go out of order. Ethernet interfaces, let's see, show IP interface brief, let's see what we're using. Alright, zero and zero one, okay. Um, access group, no spoof in. Okay. Uh, prevent IP address spoofing on both Ethernet interfaces. Of router three. Any denied packet should trigger a log. So I guess do we need to apply this ACL to both interfaces? I don't know. Um, this is the reverse path forwarding. Uh, check. I feel like a combination of both of these would provide pretty good protection against that. I don't know what the correct answer is for that. Uh, I don't know what they're what they're getting at. This is a, a short one. Do not use the same method on Ethernet 00 and 01 to implement this security feature. On Ethernet 01, ensure that the implemented spoofing method relies on the content of the routing table of router 3. I think this is already completed. Wait, on Ethernet 00, allow only packets sourced from the slash 16 network, okay. So 00 has got the access list in it. Ensure that a PC located in VLAN 10 may communicate with the DHB server through router three. So does that mean we need to turn on the helper address? You know, and allow, um, you know, DHCP um, ports, I guess, or is it, Protocol numbers? What the hell is it? Protocol numbers? 68. IP address of the DHCP server is... All right, so maybe we need to define a helper. On Ethernet 01, allow packets from the subnet should not be s s submitted to the spoofing control. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a look at that later because I really want to dissect that. I, I was thinking maybe I could rush ahead and, and grab an easy one, but... Looks like what I've really done is just wasted some time. So this is a interesting lesson in time management. All right, seven minutes left to redistribution. Users report that IPv4 IGP routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the IPv4 redistribution troubleshooting section. Router six and nine cannot communicate with the subnet 
172.10.35, and router 1 cannot communicate with the subnet 23. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of the topology expected behavior. OSPF and RIP are mutually redistributed on 3 and 4. OSPF and EIGRP are mutually, mutually redistributed on router 5. All devices should be able to reach all subnets. Use the redistribute connected where required and not restricted by the scenario. Here's the routing table for six. Show IP route. Uh, router six and nine cannot communicate with 35. Where is 35? Okay, got it. Uh, show run. From OSPF. Uh, router EIGRP. Redistribute connected route map. router five 30 There's 35. What's the next one? Uh, router six and nine cannot communicate with. All right, well, that's taken care of. Router one cannot communicate communicate with the subnet uh, 23. That's because we filtered at router two. So we need to take a look at router four. Uh, show IP route. There's 23, it's coming in via rip. Uh, going back to router three. Let's take a look at this redistribution between RIP and OSPF. Redistribute OSPF route map O2R. Where's our route map? Match IP address OSPF access list. Okay. Let me try that again. OSPF redistribute RIP subnets through route map R2O. Route map R2O is permit match IP address. And this is permit it says 23 is permitted I'm wondering if if any of those are in here what comes from uh, 104 103 
Okay. What's going on here? Have I been reading it wrong the whole time? I think I have. Alright, OSPF, we're redistributing RIP subnets, show route map, R2O, R2O uses the access list, show access list, RIP, it's in there, it's got one match, check router one, show IP route, there's 23 coming from OSPF external type two, over to router four, boom. Oh my god. You hear that? Oh my god. That was the timer. So, if that was the end of my session, I hope. Let me just review that, but I think I might have got that correct. Let me just read the requirements again. Users reported that IPv4 IGP routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the IPv4 redistribution troubleshooting section. Router 6 and Router 9 cannot communicate with... 35 we just did that but let's see if it goes both ways 65 yes yeah, 65 is here okay and router one cannot communicate with 23 which we see it has a nice prefix there all right, OSPF and RIP are mutually redistributed on three and four. OSPF and EIGRP are mutually redistributed on router five only. All devices should be able to reach all subnets. I haven't tested that yet. Use the redistribute connected command where required, not restricted by the scenario. Okay. You may not configure dynamic routing protocol on any additional interface from those indicated on the thing. All right, so a preliminary read through would say that I got that correct, but I have not uh, verified yet. Hey guys, looks like we got some visitors in the channel. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, welcome back, buddy. Hey, great to see you laughing and prepping for January. Get those numbers. Hoorah. You, man, I am slacking, bro, big time. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Sam Adams. Uh, I use GNS and EVNG uh, for CCNA prep at home. I use Cisco 2960s and 1941 physical routers at school, too. Yeah, I mean, for, for you know, building labs and working at home and on the go, yeah, virtual is the way to go. Um, there is some additional value of working on physical gear. Uh, the additional value is the experience of moving around Cisco images, upgrading routers, um, understanding how long it takes for command output to show up. If you have a large routing table or a large running config and you do show run and you want to pipe it to something, on the virtual equipment, generally speaking, it goes pretty quickly. If you're working with old 1900s or 1800s or even anything, <laughs> some 2600s, that command output coming through a console line can take a long time to show up on your screen. So there is some real lessons learned from working with the real gear. Um, that you won't get in the in the uh, in the virtual world, but if your focus is strictly exam prep, then you can get away 100%, 110% with virtual gear for exam prep. For most CCNA and CCMP courses, you can get away with um, a packet tracer and uh, and GNS3. For moving on to some of the larger exams like data center and the security related stuff. Um, I think you can do CCNA security in Packet Tracer almost completely, uh, but anything beyond that, I would definitely recommend spending some more time with, with larger software like GNS3 or EVNG. Um, 
and, and getting to work with those some of the full systems, the, the firepower um, management center, uh, firepower threat defense, um, um, ASAs, which I know they have ASAs in, in Packet Tracer now, but I don't think all of the commands are supported. Speaking of physical gear, did you see Peeps? Uh, did you see Peeps? David Bumble's latest YouTube video, Live Lab 3. Uh, latest YouTube videos, Live Labs 3, and you get 250 hours a month. I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, mentor, see if you can. Um, uh, let me see here. Mentors, can you drop a link uh, to what you're talking about? I don't know what you're talking about there. Drop a link for reference. And uh, glad to have you in channel today, uh, mentors. Uh, last Sunday, I did not stream. I did not lab at all. I had a, um, a plumbing issue at my house that uh, that needed to be handled. And so I did that last Sunday. And the holiday season just throws me off. You know, it's hard to uh, get a good groove going when you have so many family events Uh but yeah, I go on vacation just after Christmas. I come home just after the new year. And when I do, I'm not going to be streaming and I'm not going to be um, doing much. Uh, I'm, I'm swearing off social media altogether. So I won't be on Twitter. You guys won't see me on there. You won't see me posting any videos. But what I want to do is do a hardcore 30-day study and, uh, and work through some labs and really make this the most valuable use of my time. And then I want to go take the test, fly down to Richardson, Texas, and take that damn test. And um, I know I have a lot of room for improvement. I definitely don't think I'm going to win on the first try. But I can guarantee I'm going to learn a lot. And, um, and I'm going to, uh, you know, really dedicate myself and my time. It's... Um, this has been going on for, I think, way too long. You know, since last June is when I passed the written. So uh, almost six months. I've learned a lot in six months. Um, let's see. If you create and share labs, he will review, and you can use Live Labs 3 for free or even sell your own labs if he approves. Definitely a great idea, and look forward to seeing this project mature. Yeah, that sounds like fun. That's... Uh, that's a really cool idea, and uh, uh, you know, David Bumball's definitely been doing a lot for um, the CCNA community, and um, and a lot of people really enjoy his content, so that's great. Um, I won't be uh, getting sidetracked very much, uh, so I I got to keep my eye on the prize, um, and I don't know what's in store for me after CCIE. I don't know. Definitely a break. <laughs> Definitely some much needed time with the family. So we'll see. All right. So that ends my time uh, on my timer. Uh, I This lab that I was doing was a two hour lab. I gave myself two hours and I finished six out of 10 tickets. So um. I finished three of the tickets, I think. No, no, two of the tickets in like the last, maybe three of the tickets, like in the last 30 minutes. So um, it definitely does come down to the wire. Um, and uh, I think what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and work through the rest of the tickets. I'll keep streaming. I'll work through the rest of the tickets, which is uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10, so four more tickets. And then um, I'll go ahead and grade my, uh, grade my lab here and see if I'm close, you know. Uh, I feel pretty confident about what I've done so far. But always, um, always when, you're, when you're grading your own work, you tend to be a little forgiving. I know that from prior experience. So what I want to do and what I've always tried to do is be um, 
really harsh on myself with the grading. Uh, and that's because some some of the Cisco labs and, and I, I know there's a, for the CCIE, I know there's a grading script. So it goes through and runs a script on all of your routers real quick um, and, and grades it that way. Um, as well as I think there's a, a human review. There's actually someone who reviews the actual uh, command output should you have any discrepancies. And um, I don't know how harsh that's going to be. Um, in my experience with the Cisco 360 and the graded labs, if your output doesn't match the output they're looking for, you get it wrong. And so um, you really have to be right on the nose with it. And, um, you know, I try to, when I grade myself, I try to give myself that same scrutiny, that same level of scrutiny. Um, so I'm not like, you know, convincing myself that I'm doing better than I really am. I'd rather convince myself that I'm doing worse than I really am. Therefore, when I actually go and sit for the exam, hopefully I'll be pleasantly surprised. But I got a lot of room to grow. Um, a lot of room to grow. Uh, mentors, um, uh, if you don't pass this attempt, my man, I'm going to take a break as well and follow a few more cert paths and other projects I've been working on. Yeah, good luck to you. Um, I know you said you had made a run at this before. Um, when is your... Uh, uh, are you going to try and take it, uh, take it again soon? I don't know. I don't know when the last time you took it was or, um, or when, if you have any upcoming tests scheduled. Yeah, you can let us know. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on um, uh, ticket number seven. And I guess what I'll do is I'll start a timer uh, scheduled for January 11, 2019. That is just around the corner, my man. Holy cow. Holy cow. I wish you the best. Absolutely the best. Um, in fact, I suggest you get offline right now and just go studying because I tell you what, for my January, I won't be online at all. I have to just study, study, study. Whiteboard. I got this whiteboard behind me. I got my, my where is it? Robot Santa. My kids wanted to draw um, robot stuff <laughs> and got some honeydew list chores. Um, yeah, man, good luck to you. Hit it hard. Do everything you can. And uh, and uh, we'll be pulling for you here. You know, I'm supporting you uh, just like you've always supported me and the rest of the community. Uh, you've always done such an awesome job of uh, supporting all of us, giving us words of encouragement. And, uh, and I hope uh, you can feel that we're doing the same for you. Definitely, it's a hard test. Oh, my God, it's a hard test. I haven't taken it yet, but I've, I just know so many good people that I know of who didn't pass it. Um, and that's just a testament to how difficult it can be. So I wish you the absolute best. Go study, go lab, and come let us know on January 12th how well you did. So um, I'm going to start ticket number seven. Uh, I have a, I'm changing my timer around to a stopwatch style, so I'm just going to hit the go button, solve the last four tickets, or hopefully solve the last four tickets, and, uh, and see how long it takes. And then I'll uh, probably have lunch at lunchtime, and uh, we'll grade my exam. And if there's time in the afternoon, uh, I don't know if there is. Cause like I said, it's very busy around the holidays with family events and stuff. I got some family coming in today. If there's time in the afternoon, maybe I'll kick out another lab. Um, I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's get the stream going here. Ticket number seven, users report that IP security does not operate according to the requirements provided in the security troubleshooting section. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of the topology, expect the behavior, and to determine. Prevent IP address spoofing on the Ethernet interface. So this was the ticket that I was reading ahead, thinking that I could just jump ahead and get a quick win. Uh, and actually, I think there's more to it than than what I had originally thought. So, on Ethernet 00, zero uh, okay, let's start with router 3. And let me start my timer. Timer going. Okay, router 3. Show IP interface brief. 
All right, I have two interfaces here. Uh, show run interface. Paste, paste. Only allow packets sourced from the 172.10 slash 16 network. Show uh, access list, no spoof. All right, permit IP 172.10. This is a slash 16. Any, and we see lots of matches in here. Ensure that a PC located on VLAN 10. Let's see, where is VLAN 10? Okay, that's the 23 network, which is Ethernet 00. zero. May communicate with a DHCP server through router 3. The IP address of the DHCP server is 35254. Okay, so I think we need to do a helper. IP helper address. Uh, destination address 172 10 35 I think that's good here I'll, I'll kick, click the music back on all right music on so what I don't know is do I need to allow in the access list, the helper address. I mean, uh, excuse me. Uh, so DHCP is going to want to hit broadcast address. And so what is that? Let me see. Um, DHCP. I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, DHCP protocol. I thought it was protocol 68 or something. Or port 68. IP protocol. Uh, it should be UDP. Uh, yeah, discover message using the destination address, uh, limited broadcast, or the specific subnet broadcast address, directed broadcast. Yeah, UDP destination port 67. So, let me make sure I see the direction of that access list. And it's coming in. So, I wonder if I, on here, need to add in the broadcast address. No, 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 no. It wouldn't be the. It wouldn't be the source address. It would be a destination broadcast, UDP. But this is a. It's an extended. Okay. Alright, I don't know if this is exactly what they're looking for, but let's let's give it a try. Alright, config um, IP ac access list extended. Let's try to no spoof. Um, permit uh, I think we can do the line number. Let me figure out what sequence we are. Uh, let's put it at 15. All right, 15. Permit. 
uh, UDP uh, I don't even know if I can put a host like that Source I guess we should probably put like uh, 172. What the hell is that subnet? 172.10.23.0 uh, to a destination. Uh, see, I don't know if it's going to use the broadcast address or if it's going to use the limited broadcast address. Uh, 67 I think this will work show I mean, I guess this takes care of it already, right? IP, um, our subnet fits within that supernet. Um, uh, this subnet fits within this space. Our destination of any, right, encompasses all hosts and ports. So I guess that works anyways. I really don't need that, that specific... Um, uh, access uh, ACE. Um. On Ethernet 01 of router 3. Packets from the subnet should not be submitted to this spoofing control. All right, so there they got some reverse path forwarding um, verification here. So what I'm going to do is just sort of work through it. Um, IP verify. Uh, unicasts
allow self ping and 150. All right, let's check the um, uh, do show uh, access list 150. I don't know if it's an inverse operation here or not. If it's a permit, means it permits it. I think this might be like a, I, I feel like this may need to be flipped. I don't know if I should just leave it or flip it. I guess uh, maybe flip. How I want to do this. I actually, you know, while I'm just sitting here silently, just trying to figure this out, I'm remembering that I wrote a blog on this a long time ago about um, reverse path forwarding, uh, checking, and I'm wondering, <laughs> it was, it's been like in probably a year ago, I'm wondering if I even have this right. Um, Oh, I like this. Show, oh, show Unix. That's uh, the storage. Um, show uh, show IP. Show run interface eight zero one. Um, show IP. Verify. What the hell is it? Let me go look at my own blog. I actually don't know how the how can I search on this damn thing on my own blog? Uh, IP verify. Unicast reverse path forwarding.
Okay. Let's check it out. Uh, show. Show Ceph interface. Uh, ETH01. And input feature. Unicast or birth path forwarding. IP unicast is enabled. And then show IP traffic, huh? And here's the reverse path, reverse path forwarding statistics. This is from my own blog, and I forget about all this. And show IP interface. Okay. Show IP interface E01. All right, IP verify source reachable via any allow self ping ACL 150. Verification drops, suppressed verification drops, verification drop rate. All right, that's uh, 01. Let's see if I can fake something here. Uh, what router is that? Router three. That's on 01. Uh, router five. Let's see if router five can. And let's see router three. There we go. Uh, it is being dropped. <laughs> uh, should be five, right? Verification drops. It is being dropped. So I think the answer to this question is it needs to be the access list needs to be the other way. On ethernet zero one packets from the subnet should not be submitted to this spoofing control. I think it very much is, right? Show IP traffic. Uh, here we go. Uh, four encapsulation failed. Five unicast uh, reverse path forwarding drops. Okay. So. Okay, so I have it wrong, the access list here. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is the right way. Let's try it. So what I want to do is do the same ping again, but I don't want to see the counters increase. Same ping again. So everything should be plus five, or rather, I don't want to see it plus five. What the hell is my phone beeping like that for?
All right, so let's get on router three and show IP. Come on, baby. Traffic, same. Okay, show IP interface eight zero one. Right, we don't see any additional verification drops. And show, 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 show. Well, that's all we're gonna see for the drops. And then from router five, for example, ping. Let's see. Yeah, we don't see anything there, show IP. Uh, traffic. Okay. I, it looks like that was probably right in the beginning. Um, you know, the lab comes with a lot of stuff pre-configured on it. Um, looks like that was right. It just needed some, maybe the helper address. I, I really can't tell. Um, I'm going to give that one a check mark because my verification shows that it's correct, but again, we'll compare uh, my results against um, the um, my results against the what the hell am I saying? Compare my results against the what up network bro? What's happening, buddy? I uh, got to compare my results against the um, answer key and see if we're right. Could be right, could be wrong. Uh, that was uh, that was a little loopy one. In case anyone wants to know, this was the the blog that I wrote a long time. When did I write this? July 31, 2017. Holy shit. A year and a half? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's too long ago. Great content I posted here, but I can't believe I forgot it. Well, that's what happens. You don't do it for a year and a half? That's what, that's what happens. You loot, you forget everything. Anyhow, this is the, uh, the link to my blog that uh, has the blog post that I just uh, referenced because I remember I did this a long time ago. Anyhow, it's, I got a lot of great information on um, unicast reverse, pass, reverse path forwarding. I've been butchering that all morning. I'm starting to get hungry and a little grumpy. I'm getting hangry. All right, ticket eight, ticket nine, ticket 10. Three tickets left. Also, I'm getting some some messages coming in on Twitter. Got some important stuff to do, man. A lot going on here. Got to get out of here and start doing some CTFs, guys. Holiday hack challenge, cloud shark challenge, everything. Everyone's got a Christmas thing to do. So I'm going to start hacking these things up. All right, let's pop back. Users report that the IPv6 routing domain does not operate according to the requirements provided in the IPv6 troubleshoot troubleshooting section. Uh, router 2 cannot ping the IPv6 subnet. Let's see what else I have. What's going on here? Um, user uh, bu 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 cannot ping the subnet. Okay. Oh, there's three subnets it can't ping. Okay. While resolving this ticket, refer to the description of the topology, expected behavior, and network policy, special goals and restrictions, subsections, and determine your appropriate your solution is appropriate. The IPv6 topology, let's grab that topology map. Guys, I print my materials. All of this is delivered via, you know, PDF. Um, but, uh, but I like to print it because I have, you know, not a lot of screens to look at. <laughs> I don't know. I know I should probably be practicing with two screens just like it is. Um, just like it is uh, in the lab. But I just uh, do it because it's... Uh, Allows me to just easily grade my stuff here. Let's see what Network Bro has to say. 
Uh, question about the physical lab for the IE level. Uh, at a minimum, how many routers, how many switches to prepare for the written and lab would you need? Uh, how many would you need? Um, so to prepare for the written, it's a good idea to do some level of, um, of labbing, right? I feel like most people would probably agree that, you know, you learn more by doing hands-on and um, so even while preparing for the written, I definitely recommend some labbing. And for that style of labbing, uh, I would, I, I, look, I, I will tell you this. It's impossible for me to give you an exact number of routers and switches that you would need. Okay, because there isn't an exact number. Um, but what I would say is, is go find yourself a workbook, like the INE workbook. Um, or the Cisco 360 um, um, expert level training labs. I get a package there. And, um, and what you'll find is, is in the, um, in the INE workbook, there are 10 routers and four switches. And I think in these labs that I'm doing, the Cisco 360 labs, there are 10 routers and four switches too. Um, with those 10 routers and four switches, you can do, I mean, nearly endless configurations, right? Because it doesn't matter how they're physically connected. It's the logical networks that you can build with them, you know, and that's what you'll see with the, a lot of the workbooks. Um, so, so it's hard to say. Um, when I build my own labs, I built um, two topologies. I call it the six shooter and the eight shooter. And... Um, it's six routers and three switches, and then the eight shooter is uh, is eight routers and four switches. And it's a, again, it's not how many routers or how many switches, but it's rather the the logical network that you can build with them. You know, um, yeah. So so those are the two workbooks. Um, I and E is going to be their workbook is going to use ten routers, four switches. Uh, Cisco 360 material is going to use 10 routers, 4 switches. And then Narbuk's, uh, uh, Narbic uh, from uh, Micronix, his uh, workbooks, I think, are 10 or 12 routers and a couple of switches. Um, and it varies. You know, some labs you only use 3 routers, some labs you use all 12. So it definitely varies. Um, but I think more importantly is to get yourself set up with a good labbing platform. You know, like uh, EVNG is what I use. Um, I've used GNS3 before. GNS3 is fine. You know, a lot of people can study for most of the CCIE right from GNS3. Packet Tracer is kind of out of the question for uh, most CCIE stuff. Just because they don't support um, the full-blown iOS. So, uh, so definitely get yourself a good GNS3 or, or EVNG. Or if you don't want to stand up or maintain any of your own labs, you can go and buy some uh, like rack rental tokens or rack rentals, um, virtual rack rentals. That is, you know, where you pay like I don't know, somewhere between a hundred and a thousand dollars, and you can uh, you know do all these labs virtually on basically someone else's gear hosted in a data center somewhere. So th there's lots of options, lots and lots of options. Uh, I would say yeah. So ten routers and four switches. Um, most most um, workbooks will use that many. Now I say workbooks because the CCIE lab is far more than that, right? And I don't know because I haven't taken it, right? But I've seen some of the sample topologies and the practice materials, and there can be anywhere from thirty to forty devices, a mix of routers and switches. But the fact is, is like, if you try to build your own topology of 30 or 40, unless you have all the pre-staged configs and topologies and, and, and tasks, you know, predefined, you're really just wasting a lot of time. Uh, that's why I think I really like the workbook approach. It allows you to sort of target a specific technology and, and work on it um, un until you're ready to move on. So yeah, 10 routers and four switches, and I would do it all virtual. Um, I run my EVNG uh, setup on um, an old PC. I, I, I say this all the time. You don't need a big beefy server 
You don't need redundant power. You don't need 10 gig NICs. You don't need 128 gigs of RAM. I run my EVNG as a VM on an old PC, which is a Core i3 processor. A Core i3, that's like 10 years old. Core i3 PC hardware. And I have 16 gigs of RAM in that machine, but EVNG only gets eight. Okay, so again, it's not a matter of cores and memory that determines how large of a lab you can build. It's what images you use from Cisco if you're studying for Cisco lab. The CSR 1000 Vs are going to consume the most possible resources, right? For, for my lab, I could probably only spin up three or four before I'm completely maxed out. Um, if I'm using the VIOS images or the IOS V images from their viral package, uh, which I have and I have them up and running, um, I can get about 10 or 12 of those up and running. You have to start them at like three at a time because they consume a lot of resources on boot, but you can run about 10 or 12. And then if you use the IOL images, the IOL images, I've run topologies that had like 40 devices on them with eight gigs of RAM and had lots of room uh, left. So it really depends on the images you use on how large of a topology you can support. So I really don't think the cores versus memory uh, comparison, uh, it's really not apples to apples, unless you're talking about the same images. So again, I'm running a Core i3 processor. I don't know what the speed is, some old one, and, uh, and eight gigs of RAM on my VM. And if you use the IOL images, I can run all of that with tons of room left over. If you run the IOS V or the VIOS images from Viral, um, you can get about 10. And if you run the CSR 1000 Vs, you can get about three, maybe four. But uh, yeah, some people, you know, some people sort of procrastinate their studies by like, you know, wanting to go build a big server and a bunch of new hardware and a bunch of equipment and, you know, and I say to hell with all that, you know, function over form, you know what I mean? Let's get it up and running. Let's get it working. And, um, you know, with as least as possible. And, and so that's what I do. That's what I do. It's not for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody, but, uh, but yeah. Um, I also did a blog post um, a while back on how to get EVNG running in Google Cloud. And many others have gotten GNS3 in Google Cloud or Azure platform or... Uh, and even EVNG in Azure. So if you don't want to host it yourself, um, if you don't have a server, you don't have any extra hardware and you don't want to host it yourself, you can definitely use, um, you know, cloud resources. Here is, it's on the front page of my blog here. Uh, this has a YouTube video you can follow. And, um, and this will get you up and running in Google Cloud. Now, you do need to grab the Cisco images. That's up to you to do, right? There's different ways to acquire those. Um, so it's up to you. Choose your path. But you can absolutely run it in the cloud and not have to have a server or a PC or anything at home. Um, I do that, too, when I'm, using some, when I'm building some of the bigger topologies that need 20 or 30 routers. Um, I'll do it in Google Cloud. All right, guys, back at it. IPv6, here we come. Uh, users report that the IPv6 routing domain, okay, I already read that. The IPv6 topology, shown on the IPv6 IGP diagram. All routable IPv6 prefixes start with the hexadecimal. FEC0. EIGRP IPv6 is configured for the subnet. R2 and R4 should form the IPv6 EIGRP neighbor relationship with R1 via unicast communications. Okay, router 2 and router 4 must not form the direct neighbor relationship. Okay. I guess start with that. All right, routers one, two, and four. Show IPv6 interface brief. 
All right, Feco. Show IP v6 interface brief. Feco four. Show IP v6 interface brief. I'm starving, y'all. My belly is rumbling over here. Okay. Show run interface tunnel 124. Okay, actually, that's not over the tunnel. That's over the physical interface. Hmm. Show IPv6 EIGRP neighbors. So I'm just checking to make sure the interfaces is, are on. And, um, and then we do have neighbors. So we do. So let's see what, the, what is the problem. EIGRP for IPv6 configured on the subnet. Router 2 and 4 should form an IPv6 adjacency with router 1 via Unicast. Router 2 and router 4 must not form direct neighbor adjacencies. Okay, so I guess let's get on. Uh, show run section router EIGRP okay neighbor statements show run section router EIGRP again unicast show run section I wonder if I'm <coughs> I wonder if I'm wasting my time double checking these All right, OSPF v3 is configured as follows. Process one. <coughs> Area zero. Process two. Area zero. Okay, router two and three. Um, show IPv6 protocols. Routers two and three. Show IPv6 protocols. All right, router two is process ID two. Redistributing EIGRP. What the hell am I on? Router 3? Router 3? Uh, process ID 1? No, 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 that's not right. Uh, this is, wait, this is IPv4. Wait. 
IPv6, OSPF1. All right, here's a. Uh, It says no DR should be elected. No multicast should be seen in VLAN 10. So uh, that means we need. That means we need to define a neighbor. All right, those are loopback, loopback. Here's our interface. The hell interface is that? ETH00. Okay. Show run interface ETH00. Okay. Point to multi point. That's no DR election. Non broadcast. Okay. This is process two, area zero. All right. Conf T interface. Boom, 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 boom. Hungry. I think I'm going to get some pizza or something. You know, it's Sunday pho day. Got to get my pho after I do my labs, but I'm feeling the need for some Italian. You know what I'm saying? Got a nice little Italian joint up the street. I have to get a grab and go. IPv6, OSPF2. Neighbor? Now what am I doing here? Neighbor. Let's see. Fady. Show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. All right, process ID two, uh, router two. Show run. Let me just grab this uh, ETH zero zero, ETH zero zero. Network point to point non non broadcast. Okay, so we need to put a neighbor statement in there. I think we can do it right here. Uh, neighbor. Come on. All right, Fady. Eighty-three. Show IPv6 OSPF neighbor. Ethernet zero zero. All right, now we got a neighbor. Now we're full. Now I think I need to redistribute from one process to another. Ensure that the OSPF, let's see, all networks must be advertised with their original masks only. Really, they. Ensure that the OSPF process ID 2, router ID of router 4, Well, they bring some snacks into the testing room. You think they'll allow that? What? Wait a second. This is router four. It says ensure that the OSPF process ID two. That's wrong. Router ID of router four is. And then it says ensure that the OSPF process ID one of router three is. It might be a misprint in the lab manual. Could be. Uh, OSPF, process ID one of router three, router ID. Yeah, I think that is a, a misprint. Try PV6 route. Let's see, I'm learning this from two and I'm learning this from four. 
get that subnet. There was a couple of loopbacks I needed to see as well. The loopbacks are on router three. So let's go ahead and go over to router two and do show IPv6 route. All right, 23. Let's see, I see 103. That's 103. All right, there's our 124s. 133. Do I see 43 in here? I don't see it. Are we doing redistribution or no? Uh, OSPF v3 and EIGRP for IP usage are mutually redistributed on two and four. Okay, so that means on four. We need to bring that into OSPF. No, no, no. We need to bring that into EIGRP. Default metric, okay, that's there. Router one. All right, I think I have a split horizon issue here. No, IPv6, split, horizon, EIGRP, 100. So what I would expect to see here on router two is I should expect, expect it to see the 43 in the second hextet here. There it is, there's the external. Okay. And then four should see the 23 in its routing table. I don't know if I ever did a show IPv route here. Uh, show IPv6 route that is. There's the 43, wait, it says local? No, 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 23. 23 sees the external, okay, via EIGRP. I'm going to give myself a check mark for that one. I hope we got it right. All right, two more tickets. Two more tickets, y'all. Uh, tired, I'm cranky. I've been going for 48 minutes on the last two tickets. All right, quality of service troubleshooting section. This, I will likely have to have to dump this. <laughs> um, oh boy. Let's see. Users reported that QoS does not operate according to um, the requirements provided in the quality of service troubleshooting section. Okay. On router two in times of congestion, ensure that the traffic that is sent out of Ethernet 00 interface is given a specific bandwidth according to the following specifications. HTTP traffic should get at least 20%. SMTP should get at least 20%. DNS traffic should get at least 5%. Telnet traffic should get at least 5%. In times of congestion, ensure that voice traffic does not get more than 20% of the available traffic. Voice packets use H323 signaling. 
only a modular QoS CLI is allowed. That's our only restriction. All right, well, I think that's probably enough. What do you think? <sighs> All right. Let's figure out what we're gonna do here. Show run interface eth zero zero. Just like to see what's going on here. All right, service policy output QoS 124. Show policy map. Uh, show service. Yeah, I did. Oh, because of manager. Show policy map QS 124. Here's our different classes. Class one, class two, class three, class four. Show class map, class one. Match access group name, QoS one. Permit TCP any any from any to any equal to web traffic. Let's just work our way through this. Show class map class two. Show access list QoS two. Permit any any equal to SMTP. Show class map class three show access list QS three from any to any equal to domain all right class four show class map class four show access list QS four any any equal to telnet. Okay, so wait a second. This is TCP any any equal to domain. What was this one? SMTP. And TCP. Actually, I think the domain one needs to be uh, TCP or UDP. I want to see if that's an option. Um, IP access list extended QS3. Okay, and the last one is class voice. Show class map, class voice. Access group name voice. Uh, show access list. Voice. Uh, well, I actually don't know what those ports are. Um, uh, uh, uh. Okay, um, H three two three Cisco ports. Which IP ports are used by? That's kind of like a specific piece of hardware. Let's see. Does this add up? Yeah, I think I've seen this range before. I think it's sort of like well known. Uh, the call setup is 720. 
There's a whole bunch of other stuff here. Uh, TCP, yeah, uh, TCP for 720, let's go call manager, uh, that's for a different protocol, TCP3. I'm just going to verify the ports. I know I'm looking it up as a resource and I wouldn't have this in the, uh, in the lab. Actually, I think you, you do have access to documentation, but from, from my conversations with folks who have taken the exam, you, there's just no time. Um, there's just no time to look anything up. You know, just consider it off limits, uh, which I think is, is uh, you know, great to achieve. All right, so this did not give me anything. Uh, I might just have to say okay. Is there something I'm missing here? In times of congestion, ensure that voice traffic does not get more than 20% of the available traffic. Voice packages use H323 signaling. So I don't know what... What ports, I guess, so protocols. Uh, but maybe we can do show policy map and look at that policy map one more time. Which is called... I don't think I've changed anything. But I feel like this is meeting the goals. Uh, oh, I did change the, the DNS to include UDP. Could that be it? I'm, I'm gonna mark this one with a, with a circle indicating like I've, comp I've done some tasks, but I don't know if it's right. So last ticket guys, last ticket. I desperately am trying to rush through this because I want to eat. I want to go eat. I'm hungry. And I've been at it for one additional hour. Uh, users reported IP services do not operate according to the requirements given in the IP services troubleshooting. Ensure all configuration changes on R4 are logged. Set the maximum number of entries retained in the configuration log as two times larger as the default value. Suppress the display of password information in the configuration log files. <sighs> I think this is it.
Set the maximum number of entries retained in the configuration log as two times larger than default value. Ensure that configuration maximum. Suppress the display of passwords. Uh, hide keys. Yeah, that's on by default. Uh, I don't know how to. Set the size. Logging. Default is a hundred. Oh, wait a second. Default is a hundred, but mine says a thousand. Uh, do show. Show run section. It says log size a thousand. Default is a hundred, two hundred. I don't know how I got to be a thousand. I guess that's it. I don't know. I guess that's a wrap. That was ticket 10. I don't know. It felt like it was pretty easy, but I, I probably got something wrong. Anytime that, anytime that, anytime that something like feels too easy, I assume I got it wrong because I don't know. I guess, I guess I'm just expecting everything to be hard. Um, you know, this is a hard test, and I expect everything to be hard, and I expect nothing to be given away for free, right? Everything should be earned. And um, so whenever I hit something that's easy, I'm like, mm, I must be missing something. So assuming that I'm missing something on that, um, I'm going to call that a wrap. I'm going to say that that's done. So I guess I'm going to kill stream and um, get ready to go eat some lunch, and then I will come back and probably grade my exam. I know i got a lot going on. Um, today, I got a lot going on in the next couple of weeks, couple of days. So, um, but I am getting ready for doing a hardcore cram starting January 4th. You won't see any streams from me. You won't see any social media from me. You won't see me go live at all. Um, and I will be labbing, 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 studying, studying, studying. In fact, I have some good notes here of stuff I need to study. So, um, so that's a wrap, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining me this morning. I had some good conversation over in the chat window. Um, I really appreciate um, everyone's time. Uh, I hope uh, me sharing my journey is helpful. I hope, uh, you know, even if it's not technically helpful, if I'm not sharing any, um, you know, um, uh, lessons on technologies, but rather just sharing my journey, hope that it's uh, maybe spiritually and personally helpful for those out there who um, are trying to do the CCIE journey as well or any study path. So that's a wrap for me. I will see you guys next time.